Today we're going to cover off a topic that has caused a lot of pain in the auto industry, and that is pre-reporting. What is it? How does it work? And what are the ramifications for the industry, for the customer, the dealers, and the car companies? Let's jump into it. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. Please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Mark, before COVID, pre-reporting was a pretty controversial thing. We saw a lot of pre-reporting going on. Companies try to curb it as much as they could, but it just it was still something very controversial thing in the automotive industry. Can you maybe explain what is pre-reporting and how it works? Absolutely, John, and you're spot on. Pre COVID and the supply shock that COVID brought to the auto industry, particularly in this country, but it ha this happens globally. So let's not think it's an Australia only thing. Pre-reporting is basically when a car company or a dealer reports a vehicle as being registered when it's not actually sold. Now, I think the, the, the important thing here is to actually outline how reporting is and what are the numbers actually telling us. In this country, we live off of effects. And sadly, a lot of motoring journalists will and reporters will say VFACs are all about car sales. That is incorrect. It couldn't be further from the truth. If you look at what VFACs actually is, it's a record of registrations in that month. Now, that in itself is a murky number because some of the cars, when we talk about pre-reporting, are not necessarily registered. So there's a discrepancy there as well. So we're talking about cars that are recorded as allegedly delivered or having a registration recorded against that VIN number. So in pre-reporting, what happens is, or in a normal reporting, a customer will order a car maybe three months ago, four months ago, or maybe even this month. And if the car's available to be delivered, that's when it's recorded as a sale, not a, it's actually not a sale, it's actually recorded as a delivery. But everyone thinks it's called a sale, but it's not. So we need to be very clear, VFAX does not record sales. It records alleged deliveries. Now I use the word alleged because the company car reporting that OEMs use to, to record their own vehicle use, uh, sometimes those cars aren't registered in the month that they're recorded. So what it is, every car, every car company reports a batch of VIN numbers that those vehicles have been delivered. And there's supposed to be a registration number attached to those VIN numbers. And it goes off to Nevdas and where we go. So pre-reporting is saying that a vehicle is delivered when in fact it is not. It could be a demonstrator in a dealership. It could be a vehicle that the dealer is recording in the OEM system that it's sold, but it's actually not. It's still sitting there. And pre-pandemic days, and it was interesting, the VACC did a, a survey amongst a whole group of franchise dealers uh, that, uh, in the state of Victoria, and they found up to 28% of all alleged deliveries were in fact pre-reported cars that were still in the dealer's stock. And you heard of horror stories where some dealer dealers were carrying up to 100 pre-reported cars in their inventory. So what happens is if a dealer has a target of say 60 and they need to achieve that target to achieve a bonus, uh, if they've say physically been able to deliver 50 cars, what that dealer may do back in the day in order to get their additional bonus to, to achieve 60 is pre-report 10 cars. Now, 10 cars you'd think isn't too bad, but what happens the next month, they've got a target of 60. They need to sell those 10 cars that they already reported last month plus the 60 for the following month. So they need to physically sell and deliver 70 cars. Because remember, when you pre-report a car, you actually don't get any money for that transaction. So you're reporting a car, say it's an average price of $50,000 or even higher, you're pre-reporting that as being sold, but you haven't got $50,000 for it. So you then have to carry that as inventory. It's suddenly a depreciating asset because the warranty clock is ticking and the, uh, the, used, the car is now a used car or a demonstrator. So the value of that car has been reduced. 
So these are the issues around pre-reporting as to what it is and how it works. Mark, so if we break it down between the OEM and the dealer, can you explain firstly why does the OEM want to do pre-reporting? And then why would the, you've explained to some extent why the dealer does it to achieve his target, but what could be other reasons the dealer would do it? Well, you're a very good question, John. The reasons for pre-reporting are a, a number of, it's actually a number. It, it sounds like you think, what a crazy thing to do. Why would you do it? Well, primarily it is, the first thing is it saves the sales director's job. Because if the sales director doesn't get target for a couple of months, they're gone. Such is the nature of the industry. You don't get target, you get shot. That's a fact of life. There isn't this, oh, you tried really hard, well done. It's not, target is target. You know, a catastrophe is a catastrophe, but a target is target. So you must achieve target. Sales director first. The second one who's in the gun sights is the managing director. Now, back in the day when the managing director controlled the factory here and a whole heap of engineering, etc., there was a bit of leeway if you didn't get your target because you're about juggling all these activities. Whereas now, basically, the managing director is the head of a sales company. So the first person to get shot will be the sales director. If you didn't get your target, that was set by someone far, far, far away overseas who says you need to achieve this number and you have to sign on to that number. The managing director signs on to that number too because their KPIs are there. So the sales director, managing director need to achieve that monthly target basically to keep the, the hounds at bay from the overseas head offices. They then set the target, give a dealer a target, and the dealer then has a financial incentive to achieve that target. Now, if all the marketing activity and all the product elements of the vehicle aren't matching that ambition for the target, then it becomes a push to achieve the number. Everybody wants a natural flow of, if my target's 60, I've got 60 people coming in to buy those cars that I've ordered in, and they're going out in an orderly fashion, and everybody's happy. That's in the perfect world, or even in the situation which we've had recently over the last three years where there's been short supply. Well, it's a matter of, well, you set a target, but then whatever you sub comes in goes out. So I don't need to push anything. Right, that, that has changed because now so as supply comes back, certain brands will have supply, others will not. And the expectation is that you have a volume increase each year in order to maintain your share of market. So the managing directors and uh, sales directors have a KPI to push. The dealer principals get a financial incentive if they achieve target. So there's the incentive for the dealer to achieve it. However, the dealer ultimately gets left holding the baby because the risk on those pre-reported cars then sits with the dealer. They've been paid their bonus money. They've now got to clear those cars before the next month's volume has to come through. So they're the pros. Now, the other pro from an OEM perspective is that in order to, if you've got a volume target of say 10,000 you need to achieve, and there's some good stock and some tricky stock, you need to be achieving those numbers. Otherwise, what will happen is your country will not get supply. So the OEM will then push. Another reason for the OEM to push for free reporting is that they, as long as you're achieving your number, you can go back to the parent company and say, well, I've got these, I really need those sought after cars because I'm getting my target. Therefore, I need more of these more profitable cars or more in demand cars. And you can have actually have a voice at the table as long as you're achieving target. But it's very difficult to go back to the supplying OEM and say, hey, I need these really uh, high demand medium pickup and cab chassis but I'm sitting on a whole heap of unsold SUVs and small cars that nobody wants to buy. So I've got to clear them in some way, shape or form and show that I'm achieved my sales volume numbers so I can get those other cars that are in demand that the customers want, the dealers want, and I can make some money out of. Mark, can you also share a bit around why the OEM, the overseas company, is drives that target so hard? Can you explain from what aspect? Because I've got numbers to achieve for, to keep the factory operating at efficiency. Can you explain that in a bit more detail? The reason why the sales companies get their targets is the factory has to achieve a certain volume to maintain or maximize profitability. So those, those targets are divvied up and given to each country. And, and they always look at the opportune countries. Where can we get more upside? Local markets are always looked after first. Make no mistake, the local market where the factory is and where the, the proximity to the factory always get looked after first. So it's going to always be Europe first or the USA first or Japan first, then everybody else after that. 
So they're the, that's, they're the key elements if you think of from a supplier perspective. But then it's, the, okay, what's an attractive market where we can get some good penetration or get some incremental volume? Because ultimately, everyone's KPI is more. You always have to do better previous years. Hence, that's the fundamental nature of continuous improvement is you need to always be better. So how you be better in a sales perspective is you sell more and you make more money. They're the main KPIs for what you need to do. The third one is maximize your customer satisfaction so you know to make your customers happier and happier every year. These are very difficult things to do year in, year out. And that's why there is this push for pre-reporting when supply gets a bit on the oversupply side, demand softens, and maybe the marketing activity is not achieving what it needs to achieve, or the market is actually softening, or there's more competition coming in, you then have to push your way in to achieve that share, and hence pre-reporting becomes a bigger problem. And Mark, what are some of the big disadvantages of this? Because this can have an impact on you know the government looking at how the economy is doing. Uh, what is the impact to the dealers, to OEMs, to uh, observers looking at the industry? Oh, there are many people that get affected by this. And sadly, it gets back to what we said before, John, is there really isn't an understanding or a clear picture as to what VFAX is saying. You know, we, we see it time and time again in articles where you'll have a journalist say, oh, the sales for last month. Please don't say that. It's not true. They are not the sales for last month. They're the reported deliveries for last month. The orders were placed long before or maybe even during that month or not even at all if it's a pre-reported car. So we need to be clear on the data. But sadly, it's the only mechanism that we have. So it's a bit like interest rates trying to control inflation. It's a blunt instrument. It's not accurate. And that's why we need to be clear that VFAX is not an accurate instrument. However, it's all we've got. So understanding that's all we've got, Sadly, and I've mentioned interest rates, the Reserve Bank will look at uh, VFAX figures and say, wow, look at the car sales, they're up. So therefore, we need to slow down the economy and let's increase interest rates. That's one element. They're looking at other things as well. But that does come into the basket of consideration. And the same goes for uh, the government from when they're looking at taxing or incentives or just basically what's actually the state of play and health in the economy is overinflating the, the sales figures in VFAX. You know, we, we looked at the numbers in the industry, we'd always say it was, when it was at a 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 uh, million car market, there was realistically 200,000 pre-reported cars in those numbers. So we really need to be frank that it is really a million car market as, as a natural course each year. So when we dropped down to 900 in, 2000 and 2020, all we did was clear out all the pre-reported cars because they already were in stock, but they got sold off. All right, so let's make no mistake about that. So, and then we didn't top it up with extra pre-reported cars. So we've now become more natural in a run rate, but that's going to change because it's the supplies coming in. So the government looks at it from an inflationary perspective. What's what's actually happening overstates what's going on. The other concern, and the other, other big concern is, it puts downward pressure on the value of the new car because a pre-reported car is technically a used car. The warranty clock is ticking. Now, the customer who buys that car may not know that the warranty clock is ticking because that car may not have been registered. Now, there's a process where registrations have to match the, the month that the car was reported, but it doesn't have to match the day. And some of these do still roll over in subsequent months. So what you need to look at is, is what is actual warranty start date versus the registration date. And there are many instances where those two do not line up. So you may have a vehicle that you've bought that may have been uh, registered or, or reported sold five years ago in June, but the registration may be in August. So you might be well and truly out of warranty before you realise that you're up coming up for your end of warranty check. Well, I'm sorry, you're actually, your car is actually already out of warranty. So these are some of the challenges that occur from a warranty perspective. Another issue that kicks in is when you've got a lot of pre-reported cars, it means there's discounting because the dealer is sitting, I mentioned before, the dealer is sitting on a car that's worth, say, $50,000. They don't have money for it but it's reported sold. So they've got to achieve their 60 units a month, hypothetically. So they've got to get rid of those 10 cars first in the first uh, few we first week of the, the, that month before they can work on the next 60. So you're feverishly pushing out these cars. So, and hey, when you're in a push situation, if the demand's not there, you then have to discount those cars. So they've got some incentive money on them, but you've got to push them out. 
So why smart dealers basically can pre-report a car one month, they just sell, they just sell all their 60 in that month, they sell 20, uh, 10 of the, the last month's cars, they sell another uh, 50 of this month's cars, pre-report another 10 and just keep going. And some dealers even got to the stage where they were pre-reporting a full month and selling it the next month and then just pre-reporting the next month. So they just have this cycle of pre-reporting. As long as you can keep clearing them, it's not a problem. It is a problem if they start to stick for more than a month or two and you're starting to have these pre-reported cars building up because you then end up in this situation of having a lot more inventory in stock than what you really need. And once that happens, used car values start to come under pressure, which means the demos are the first discounting level of used cars. Then you've got, uh, it pushes down. So why would you pay a premium for a low kilometer used car somewhere else if you can get a demonstrator with zero kilometers or even maybe a 1500 kilometers, that's already a five or $6,000 discount to a new car. So these are the things that you just need to be mindful of. So as soon as used car values drop, customers start to get hurt and leasing companies start to get hurt. Therefore, lease rates start to get up because you've got a bigger depreciation. So all this starts from pre-reporting. Mark, what's the implication to the dealer from a financial point? Once he pre-reports it, does he have to put down some sort of deposit on the car or how does that work? With it being pre-reported, so the car moves from new car stock into demo and depending on the finance company, that can also change the floor plan rate for that vehicle. Now, many financiers will see a demo and a new car as the same thing. Some don't. So some may look at that as, okay, if it's a used car, instead of 100% floor plan on that vehicle, there needs to be some curtailment. So it might be 80%. They've got to, they may potentially have to pay an extra 20% in, in floor plan, like pay out 20% of the value because their car is depreciating. It will vary from financier to financier. Most will still see it at this stage as being a new car. But when, if we get to a situation like we had pre pandemic where there were a lot of pre-reported cars, you know, up to 100, you know, 200,000 in dealerships around the country, that's when we know we're going to have a problem where there's going to be potentially a bigger risk for, finan for the financial burden where there's going to be curtailment where the financiers are going to say, right, high interest rates, you've got a lot of inventory, this stuff's pre-reported, what you know, you're not moving it fast enough, we need to, to, uh, to for you to uh, curtail that amount. The other disadvantage from a OEM perspective, say from a parent company looking at this, because they also look at the VFAX sales figures, and even if you try and justify that a big percentage of those are pre-reported, they don't always believe you. So the factory will be looking at that saying, well, they've sold all those cars. We need to produce the same amount next year. So then you start the whole cycle again because they then increase your target by another percentage above that, even though you've, you're sales are down 10 percent can you explain how that works yeah absolutely you raise a very good point there john it's uh it is it's it's the nightmare so as the pre-reported cars build up in the network uh you know it's not uncommon or well, back in before the pandemic it was not uncommon to see uh you know, a full month's worth of pre-reported inventory in the network plus new car stock so, you know, the deal is said to carry 45 days, they'd have 45 days of fresh inventory, plus there'd be another 30 days of pre-reported cars. So, you know, they're, they're sitting on two and a half months worth of stock, uh, which is what you don't know. And, and that stock is sticky stock and depreciating stock. When, when things tighten up and becomes more of a push instead of a pull, like we've had with the pandemic, where OEMs have to start pushing again, the, those cars need to be cleared and their visibility to the parent company is gone because if they've been pre-reported, as far as the parents thinks, they're sold, not our problem, it's the dealer's problem. The dealers have received bonus money for it, their job to clear it. And then all the KPIs still follow, look at what they've got from a new perspective and then where can we have some uplift on top of that? And that's dangerous for the dealers because that means that their targets are gonna go up higher over and above the natural run rate that they're actually achieving, uh, because there's gonna be an expectation as well, you said you're, you're selling 60 a month, when they're gonna raise your target to 70, that non natural run rate's still 50 plus 10 pre-reports, you, know, you can see that gap starts to build quite quickly and there's a lot more pain that kicks in very early. So ultimately in a nutshell, John, if you look at pre-reporting, the upside keeps people in jobs and it works well as long as the musical chairs are still, everyone's moving from chair to chair. When the music stops, and what I mean by that when the music stops is when the demand stops cleaning out 
the pre-reports and they start to build, that's when the problems start to come into play. And often when you look at a VFAX, if you see a brand that comes in with a, with a number that is very close, very round, like you know, like a 5,000 or a 7,000 or a 8,000, like right on the number or 5,001, 5,002, uh, I would look at that as a red flag to say, okay, there's been a bit of pre-reporting happening here. Now, pre-reporting doesn't have to be necessarily uh, just the dealers. The OEMs can do it too. The OEMs can do it by you know, reporting cars as company cars. And then they wash those cars out through their, their network as used cars. And that also has an upside for, um, you know, for, for things like uh, luxury car tax, uh, because you're selling at a lower value uh, than what it was if you sell it as a new vehicle. So there's all these other implications that come into play. It's a necessary evil and it, and it can work smoothly as long as everything comes in and out and there's a balance. It's when the balance is out of kilter and there's an imbalance of sales versus pre-reports. And that's when it starts to build up. Now, Mark, there's some brands who don't do any pre-reporting at all. And there's others that do ex extensive. Some seem to be worse than others. And I know there was trying to monitor the pre-reporting and try and hold brands accountable to that, uh, comparing the registrations to the pre-reporting. Can you talk, explain some of that? Do you think that really works? Oh, the FCAI do a great job in monitoring it and looking for discrepancies between the actual vehicle registrations from the state uh, governing bodies for registrations versus the reported sales that are in uh, VFAX for that particular brand and that model. So they can quickly show if there's a discrepancy and they can see, well, these, these VINs were reported in this month as being sold, but over here, they're actually registered in these subsequent months. So there's a gap and please explain. And, and there's, each, each OEM has to make sure that they, they comply. So there's been a lot of work and a lot of great work done by FCAI in leveling the playing field to, to, to really wash out pre-reporting. Now, that only just shows a gap in pre-reporting between registrations. It doesn't mean that the, the pre-reporting is not going on because you can still register a car within the same month and that will still show up as being a legitimate registration. It's the variation that shows a variation between registration and reported delivery. Pre-reporting can still be done in the same month and that's no one will be any the wiser as to that's been the case. And what's your feeling now with supplies starting to come back and do you think pre-reporting will come back or do you think it will there'll be a new the industry has been educated over COVID and will go back to a better way of operating? John? As sure as God made green apples, as a wise man used to say to me, and factories produce more cars than what are required, you get, and targets are greater than what that particular month can deliver. Now, it might be just for one month that a, a, a brand may pre-report because they might have acquired a month. Next month's going to be, we've got all these, all these pre-sold cars actually coming in that we'll be delivering and get our target that way. And it just means they need to pre-report this month. So pre-reporting is just a way of smoothing the numbers. Pre-reporting works from a, when you, when you have a, the traditional dealer model of wholesale and retail dealers, the direct sale model is an interesting one because if the OEM is selling directly to the customer, it's, it'll be interesting to see whether they manipulate the registered figures versus the actuals because if you're actually delivering it and have to re rely on the registration of the actual time to report the sale, then you'll actually get a true number. But once again, sales directors and MDs still have a target they need to achieve so there's always going to be that question at the end of the month, we're 300 away, what are we going to do? Now, 300 people suddenly don't run into your showrooms on the second last day of the month to buy a car that currently is in stock. So that's not how the world works. The world works is they'll buy maybe what they need to buy and you smooth the number over with a bit of peer reporting here and there. But the key is you've got to get your sales targets, you've got to otherwise the, deal, the sales director, the managing director, Marketing director will get their budgets cut, so they'll take away the marketing money, so that everyone's got to get their numbers. And this is a mechanism to smooth it over. But we just need to be mindful that it's, it's always been there. The key is the severity of it and how much of it is actually going on.
Now, Mark, in terms of fast-moving stock that has a customer actually behind it, but the vehicle's just been delayed for some reason, you start seeing financial year end or calendar year end, and some companies had rules around that the as long as the ship's docked with the stock on board or the, the stock's been offloaded from the ship, you could pre-report it if there was a customer name against it, even though it was going to take two, three weeks before it gets delivered to the customer. Can you talk a, a little bit around that? Explain how that all works. It's an interesting one because depending on the on the <laughs> interesting the financial reporting of those organisations, because if you're using the traditional model where it's deal uh, OEM wholesale or sales companies wholesale vehicles to dealers, dealers then sell a car to customer. The technicality is you, you well you shouldn't be able to report a car sold if it's not in the country. And yet we know in past experiences that yeah, there were some OEMs that were rec- reporting cars while they're still on boats. Now, to do that, you need to be able to invoice the car to a, to a dealer. And that depends on the financial ethos of that company. If you're tracking the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, or any organization that works the Sarbanes-Oxley, which is the US standard, you cannot wholesale a car unless you know, we can't recognize a revenue for something that has not been built and then title and risk has moved on to the the dealer. So that's something that, that that trigger point for revenue recognition is the is the key before you can a wholesale. And once it's wholesale, the dealer can re, dealer can report at retail, even still in the compound. But if they physically own it and risk is moved to them, they can re, report it in the in the compound. So these are the sort of anomalies that happen. So that's why getting back to VFAX is not orders or sales in that month. VFAX is reported deliveries in that month or for reported registrations in that month. So these are sort of things that can happen. Pre-reporting is good if it's done in moderation. It's a it's a bit like drinking. It's it's fine in moderation, but but just don't get drunk all the time. It's fine if you just want to top your target up at the end of the financial year. The vehicles have arrived, the customers' names are there, they're gonna be delivered within a week. Nothing wrong with it. Not not even just end of financial year, it's it's every month. Because you, you gotta get your target every month. So you know, it's it's just fine if okay if you if you're 30 units off, yeah, pre-report 30, uh, and then next month we'll just you know we we've got all these other deliveries, so we've got next month target covered because the boat's going to turn up and it's out they're going to go. So we've got that covered. It's 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 a smoothing game, and that's and that's the key. As a smoothing, as long as you use in moderation, it's fine. But yeah, it's it's in fact the best analogy with pre-reporting is it's it's like drinking. It's okay to have the odd drink here and there, but just don't get drunk every week or every month. That's that's not a good recipe for, for, for longevity and good health. Thank you for listening. Hopefully you got as much out of this discussion as we did. It's an interesting topic, pre-reporting. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube, Spotify and iTunes, and we'll speak to you again next week. Thanks for listening.